A would-be dogfight turns into a group hug, and Democrats' impeachment efforts move forward. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Stop putting your online data at risk. Get protected at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Okay, so last night was the big Democratic debate. It was going to be rock'em, sock'em robots. I had predicted many attacks on Elizabeth Warren. I had predicted that Buttigieg would go after Warren, and maybe Klobuchar would go after Buttigieg, and everybody would go after... Yeah, none of that happened. Instead, they just massaged each other's shoulders. And this is horrible strategy. If you're at the bottom of this pack, if you are Cory Booker, for example, or Kamala Harris, if you're one of these characters who literally has no shot of winning the nomination, then why are you sitting around waiting? What what are you waiting for? Like if you're if you're Kamala Harris and you're best known for cackling like a hyena, why exactly would you be sitting around waiting for everybody to sort of come around to you? If you're Cory Booker, why would you just be standing? I mean, I, I understand Cory Booker is actually running for vice president at this point. He has no shot at the nomination. We all get that. But even if you're one of the top candidates, why are you not jockeying for position? It is bewildering to me, particularly because Elizabeth Warren is incredibly vulnerable. So I understand why Buttigieg didn't go after Warren. He's rising. Warren's falling. He feels like if I attack Warren, there's really no upside for me. What I don't understand is why Warren isn't attacking Buttigieg, because Buttigieg is taking away her support, not Joe Biden's support. Now, maybe she's perceiving this thing wrong. Maybe Elizabeth Warren thinks that Pete Buttigieg is the one who is grabbing Biden's support. But that is not actually true. It's not actually true. Why is Bernie Sanders not going after Warren? And if he wants to regain any sort of mojo here, he has to take back the Elizabeth Warren crowd and bring it back into his column because he ain't going nowhere. He is not running first in Iowa. He is not running first in New Hampshire. He is running first zero states, zero places. He's running third to fourth nationally. So what is Bernie Sanders doing? Instead, they all get up there and they just hug it out, man. They just hug it out because I, I suppose they think at this point better to sort of be in a holding pattern, right? It's still early. We still have three months until Iowa. Maybe they think, okay, well, if we just wait this thing out, then the field will sort of shake itself out. Whatever it was, it was it was overall a very boring debate. I don't think that anything really changed. But it was, as usual, an ad for Donald Trump. It was an ad for Donald Trump because the Democrats' policies are so radical. They are so wild. And these candidates are incredibly, incredibly off-putting. The more people see of Elizabeth Warren, the less they like her. The more people see of Pete Buttigieg, the more they like him, except when he actually reveals his true face, which is that he is an extraordinarily radical candidate. He doesn't like to reveal that too often. He, he made that mistake early in the campaign. He campaigned as a moderate, started to rise, moved to the left, and then immediately fell. He's campaigning as a moderate again, is starting to rise again. But whenever people see the real Pete Buttigieg, it's a problem. The good news for Pete Buttigieg is that Pete Buttigieg is able to mask that really well. Joe Biden, everybody knows who he is. So there's a lot of talk today about Joe Biden falling down on the job, Joe Biden having a bad debate. And the reason people are saying that Joe Biden had a bad debate is because Joe Biden was basically some ambulance during this, during this entire primary season, right? He, he's basically a sleepwalker. He is just, he's, he is comatose. He is not alive. I mean, he, he's, if you shot electricity through his body, perhaps he would move. I mean, that, that really is sort of the, the <laughs> that's the rip on, but that's all priced in at this point. And then Bernie Sanders is just Bernie Sanders. He will always be Bernie Sanders. A hundred years from now, Bernie Sanders will be Bernie Sanders because he always was Bernie Sanders. He's the high school principal from Back to the Future. That dude never had hair. Bernie Sanders was always a crazed old loon bag, even when he was 25. So, did anything change last night? The answer really is no, but the people that helps are Buttigieg and Biden. It does not help Warren. It does not help Sanders. Okay, so with all of that said, let's get into what was actually said during this incredibly, incredibly overall boring debate. So first off, there, there's the, the moderators are just terrible because it's an MSNBC debate. That means that every single question is basically a kiss-ass question. Oh, could you possibly be more wonderful? Oh, could you possibly tell us why you're so wonderful? Now, Fox News gets a lot of flack for being biased. When Fox News held presidential primary debates in 2016, it created all sorts of controversy and all sorts of heat, so much so that Donald Trump actually skipped one of the debates because he didn't want Megyn Kelly asking him questions. You will never see a Democrat skip one of these debates because the only thing they have a chance of missing is an ice cream cone handed them by Rachel Maddow. That is the only thing that they, like, none of them have to fear being asked a tough question by Rachel Maddow. None. Zero. So here is just... Just to prove my point, here is a quick montage, not cut by us, cut by was Washington Free Beacon. Somebody cut a quick montage of this, of, of all the, of the moderator questions last night, or many of the moderator questions last night. And I mean, they brought their massage oils with them, man. L- listen to these questions. How central should the president's conduct uncovered by this impeachment inquiry 
be to any Democratic nominee's campaign for president? How central would it be to yours? Mr. Ray recently told Congress, quote, the majority of the domestic terrorism cases that we've investigated are motivated by white supremacist violence. Congresswoman Gabbard, to you, as president, would you direct the federal government to do something about this problem that it is not currently doing? Vice President Biden, you have suggested in your campaign that if you defeat President Trump, Republicans will start working with Democrats again. But right now, Republicans in Congress, including some of whom you've worked with for decades, are demanding investigations not only of you, but also of your son. Okay, so now, so every single question is, could you possibly be more far left? Like, let's just push you to the left, push you to the left. So that's what the debate was last night, which is why you sort of ended up with this whole kumbaya moment. Now, listen, CNN got a lot of flack in the in, in debates that were held before this one for supposedly contributing to the candidates attacking each other. That is the only purpose of a debate. The only purpose of a debate is to highlight differences between the candidates, not to highlight similarities between the candidates, but MSNBC, because it is an insane, ridiculous network, decides that instead the purpose of the debate should basically be generalized kiss-assery and demonstrating the unity of the Democratic Party in the face of Donald Trump. Yeah, we know, they don't like Trump. If anything was illuminated last night, I'm waiting to hear it. Well done, Andrea Mitchell and Rachel Matt. Well, what a joke. What a joke. By the way, when Republicans hosted debates and when, when, when Republicans had a debate in 2016 and Fox News was hosting the debates, there was no point at which Sean Hannity was one of the hosts of the debate. Rachel Maddow was Sean Hannity. The, the Fox News team used Martha McCallum, they used Brett Baer, and they used Megyn Kelly. At no point did they call in Sean Hannity. Why? Because Sean is a partisan, an open partisan. Well, Rachel Maddow is an open partisan, and bringing in Rachel Maddow to play this game is just ridiculous. So obviously nothing new was learned last night. It was supposed to be a showpiece for the candidates. Instead, it ended up being an incredibly boring affair with, with really very few punches thrown, except for the punches that Joe Biden threw at himself, but we're, we're all used to those at this point. Okay, we'll get to the actual content of what the candidates had to say in just one moment. First, let's talk about a fantastic, phenomenal gift you can get for somebody this holiday season. I am talking about the gift of preserving their memories. There's very little in life that really, I, I truly believe this is important. There's very little in life that is more important than preserving all of your family memories. I've got kids and all of the pictures that we take that we put on the, on the phone and that are digitally available, really convenient for me. But what about all the pictures from when I was a kid? My parents can't really look at those because they're all out in the garage or they're all on old VHS tapes. They no longer have a VCR. Well, if you got parents, and you got grandparents and you got old film reels in the garage. Why not get all that stuff digitized so now it's accessible? And now in case, God forbid, there's a fire or a flood or something, you're not trying to schlep mold-ridden boxes out of your garage and say, just grab a, a thumb drive and you're done. Right? That is what Legacy Box does. Legacy Box allows you to take their Legacy Box kit, fill it up with all your stuff, send it to them. And then in a couple of weeks, you get all your originals back, plus perfectly preserved digital copies ready to watch, share, and relive. Get started preserving your past today. Go to LegacyBox.com slash Ben to get 40% off your first order. Save your time and your memories. Go to LegacyBox.com slash Ben. Save 40%. LegacyBox.com slash Ben. Get that special deal. Save 40%. Makes a great holiday gift, by the way. Okay, so the debate begins, and the beginning of the debate is all about how Donald Trump is a big, mean, very bad man who's very mean. Okay, so Elizabeth Warren leads the way, and she is just irritating. She's irritating. Amy Klobuchar is Klobuchar is, is certainly not as irritating as Elizabeth Warren. On the other hand, Kamala Harris is significantly more irritating than Elizabeth Warren, but Elizabeth Warren is an irritating human being. Her faux sincerity really grates. Okay, so I'm very friendly with Senator Ted Cruz, but during the 2016 campaign, there is no question that Senator Cruz came off as insincere in, in his affect, right? It's just a problem that Senator Cruz has in his affect when he speaks on stage. Elizabeth Warren has the exact same problem, the exact same problem, except more so, right? She appears to be trying too hard at nearly every point. So here's Elizabeth Warren talking about constitutional principle, the same lady who says she's gonna propose a 2% wealth tax, which is utterly unconstitutional. It is completely unconstitutional. She's gonna pay for all of her programs with a tax that is not available under the constitution, article one, section nine. Okay, she's wildly disingenuous, but here she is talking about the value of the Constitution that she cares so deeply about. We have to establish the principle, no one is above the law. We have a constitutional responsibility and we need to meet it. Oh, wow, wow. This, the enthusiasm, the fake enthusiasm. God, she is so awful. <laughs> My favorite answer to the how bad is Donald Trump question came from Amy Klobuchar, who decided, you know, it'd be worthwhile. I'm going to quote Jimmy Carter, the worst president of the last 50 years to talk about honor and dignity and, and integrity. A guy who was ousted from office after, he's the only president of the last 50 years, ousted from office after one term, 
with no huge third-party threat like Ross Perot in the wings. Here's Amy Klob- uh, Klobuchar citing Jimmy Carter as an inspiration. I was thinking about this uh, when I was at the Carter Presidential Museum, and on the wall are etched the words of Walter Mondale when he looked back at their four years, not perfect, and he said this, we told the truth, we obeyed the law, we kept the peace. We told the truth, we obeyed the law, we kept the peace. That is the minimum that we should expect in a president of the United States. Senator, thank you. Oh, wow, quoting Jimmy Carter. Okay, now, the, the person who had the best answer to this question was Pete Buttigieg. So the person that Pete Buttigieg campaigns as when he's pretending is actually pretty attractive, right? Pete Buttigieg campaigns as Obama circa 2008 before a lot of the racial politics entered into his presidency and his campaign. The I'm a great unifier. I'm going to bring everybody together. We're going to sing Kumbaya. We're going to have unity again, higher principles. This is Pete Buttigieg doing this routine and doing it pretty well. Here's clip three. Running to be the president for that day, the sun comes up and the Trump presidency is behind us, which will be a tender moment in the life of this country. And we are going to have to unify a nation that will be as divided as ever. And while doing it, address big issues that didn't take a vacation for the impeachment process or for the Trump presidency as a whole, a climate approaching the point of no return. The fact that we've still got to act on health care, kids learning active shooter drills before they learn to read. And an economy where even when the Dow Jones is looking good, far too many Americans have to fight like hell just to hold on to what they've got. OK, Buttigieg is very good at this. The reason Buttigieg is very good at this is because the question was about Trump. But he made the answer about what he's going to do as president beyond Trump. Right? That's actually a very smart tactic, as opposed to Elizabeth Warren, who went into battle, battle, militant mode, and Amy Klobuchar, who is citing Jimmy Carter or something. Buttigieg says, no, we're going to have this moment, and then I'm going to unify the country. Now, Joe Biden's response, okay, this was his, his very first answer, his opening statement. Okay, Joe Biden says the right thing, but he looks as though he is actively going to collapse on the stage. He looks as though he is going to actually face plant. Like it's going to be one of those comedy movies where the person just stops, clutches their chest, and keels over. Here is Joe Biden's opening statement. He says something true, but he also happens to be experiencing some sort of trouble while he's saying it. Uh, you have to ask yourself up here, who is most likely to be able to win the nomination in the first place, or to win the presidency in the first place? And secondly, who is most likely to increase the number of people who are Democrats in the House and in the Senate? Okay, and I mean, he, he was like this the whole debate. He couldn't get through a sentence without stumbling because he, he's not going to get through a sentence without stumbling. So just from those opening statements, Buttigieg is the best at this. And Buttigieg has, has not had a bad debate yet, right? I mean, Buttigieg has really performed well in these debate circumstances. They're almost tailor-made for him. He is smooth. He never gives a straight answer. He's quite good at this. Also, when you contrast him with Warren, again, he looks much more attractive than Warren as a candidate to sort of the general population and particularly people in the swing states. The reason for that is because Elizabeth Warren has decided that she is going to run full-scale, hardcore progressive and alienate as many people as she can. So the candidates were asked about unity. This is a question Taylor made for Buttigieg. But Warren is asked about unity. And her answer about unity is, I am going to cram taxes down your throat. And I'm going to say that if you built a business in this country, it's because there's a road in front of your business. That, that That was considered a gaffe by Barack Obama in 2012. People forget this because Romney lost the election. But In 2012, when Barack Obama did the whole, you didn't build that, and then cited Elizabeth Warren's idiotic 2011 speech where she suggested that the reason that your business is successful is because we have a public school system. Well, that that doesn't explain why many businesses are not successful. Well, Elizabeth Warren just says it straight out. She's she's asked, how are you going to unify the country? She says, I'm going to go to the rich people's houses and I'm going to rob their safes, basically. This is not a this is not a good answer. Doing a wealth tax is not about punishing anyone. It's about saying you built something great in this country. Good for you. But you did it using workers. All of us help pay to educate. You did it using your getting your goods to ro- on roads and bridges. All of us help pay for it. You did it protected by police and firefighters. All of us help pay the salaries for. So when you make it big, when you make it really big, when you make a top one tenth of one percent big, pitch in two cents so everybody else gets a chance to make it. And here's the thing. That's something that Democrats care about, independents care about, and Republicans care about. Okay, well, no, I'm sorry that that is not what's going to unify the country. Ripping on rich people is not going to unify the country, and it is absurd to claim that it will. And and you'll see Cory Booker kind of mildly knocks her on this, and of course is exactly correct. We'll get to that in just one second. First, 
let us talk about the fact that your constitutional freedoms are under attack from the left. They are. Well, one of those constitutional freedoms, perhaps the most important constitutional freedom, is the right to keep and bear arms. The founders certainly saw this as pivotal because this allowed you to protect your rights, allowed you to exercise your natural right of self-defense. The left wants to rip that away from you. This is why I am a gun owner. It's why so many Americans are gun owners. Owning a rifle is an awesome responsibility. Building rifles is no different. Started in a garage by a Marine veteran more than two decades ago, Bravo Company Manufacturing, BCM for short, builds a professional-grade product built to combat standards. Bravo Company Manufacturing is not a sporting arms company. They design, engineer, and manufacture life-saving equipment. The people at BCM assume that when a rifle leaves their shop, it will be used in a life-or-death situation by a responsible citizen, law enforcement officer, or a soldier overseas. To learn more about Bravo Company Manufacturing, head on over to bravocompanymfg.com. You can discover more about their products, special offers, and upcoming news. That's bravocompanymfg.com. If you need more convincing, find out even more about BCM and the awesome people who make their products at youtube.com slash bravocompanyusa. And they are awesome folks. I mean, I know them. They make great products. Check them out at bravocompanymfg.com. Patriotic, many of them veterans. Bravocompanymfg.com. They are awesome. Okay, so Cory Booker comes back at Elizabeth Warren and he points out um, your tax system is idiotic. We as Democrats need to fight for a just taxation system. But as I travel around the country, we Democrats also have to talk about how to grow wealth as well. The idea behind what is fair today, the 99% in America are on track to pay about 7.2% of their total wealth but, in well, taxes. I'm not disagreeing the with that. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 that I want to say pay two cents more, they'll pay 3.2% in America. I'm tired of freeloading billionaires. Okay, she's tired of freeloading billionaires? Tired of freeloading billionaires? Billionaires are not freeloading. They're the ones paying the vast quantity of taxes beyond their ownership of the wealth percentage. It's just, what, what is she talking about? This is her, the, the, remember, the original question was about unifying people. The original question was about unifying people. Giant, giant fail for Elizabeth Warren. Pete Buttigieg, by contrast, can use Warren as a, as a point of contrast, right? But Buttigieg can actually put Warren over here and then say, okay, here's what disunity looks like. And I represent unity. Here's Pete Buttigieg, again, doing this routine well. Here's clip seven. And I believe that commanding people to accept that option, whether we wait three years, as Senator Warren has proposed, or whether you do it right out of the gate, is not the right approach to unify the American people around a very, very big transformation that we now have an opportunity to deliver. Okay, so, uh, you know, again, Buttigieg against Warren looks much better to the general population than Elizabeth Warren does. And this was her, her theme throughout the campaign. She started off as a person who always had a plan, and now she's the person who's basically Bernie Sanders, but spelled out longer and less honest. And this irritates Sanders to no end, by the way. Right? She's asked about her health care plan. And Bernie Sanders is standing over here going, she ripped me off, man. Like, why is everyone talking about Elizabeth Warren's health care plan? Right? Elizabeth Warren is asked about her dumb health care plan, which she originally suggested Medicare for all. Then she walked it back and said, oh, no, no, no. We'll do sort of Medicare for some. And then after three years, we'll have a referendum on it. And Bernie Sanders is asked about this clip nine. And Bernie Sanders is just like, why didn't you ask me about this in the first place? I'm the one who originated this. Senator Sanders, let me bring you into this conversation Thank you. I and the ask you bill. the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, again, he has every reason to be irritated. Now, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, like Buttigieg, is running on a more moderate sort of platform. And Biden hits Warren here. And this, this attack is going to continue to resonate because her plan continues to be bad. Here is Joe Biden talking about Medicare for All and why it's a giant fail. You know, uh, we can do this without uh, charging people raising 30, 40 trillion dollars. The fact is that right now, the vast majority of Democrats do not support Medicare for All. It couldn't pass the United States Senate right now with Democrats. It couldn't pass the House. Nancy Pelosi is one of those people who then thinks it makes sense. Okay, so this is a, uh, you know, th this is a telling attack. Now, while all of this was going on at the top of the field, meanwhile, there were a bunch of sideshows that were happening. The most, the, the, the most kind of pyrotechnic sideshow was this tit-a-tat between, tit -a -tat, rather, uh, between uh, tit-for-tat, tit-a-tat, between Tulsi Gabbard and Kamala Harris. And Tulsi Gabbard went after the Democratic Party, broadly speaking, and then Kamala Harris went after Tulsi Gabbard. It was amusing, but has very little impact on the race. Kamala Harris is going nowhere by attacking Tulsi Gabbard, nor is Tulsi Gabbard going anywhere by attacking Kamala Harris. Here is Tulsi Gabbard ripping on the Democratic Party, and then Kamala Harris coming back at her. 
that our Democratic Party, unfortunately, is not the party that is of, by, and for the people. It's a, it is a party that has been and continues to be influenced by the foreign policy establishment in Washington, represented by Hillary Clinton and others' foreign policy, by the military-industrial complex and other greedy corporate interests. Okay, and then Kamala Harris comes right back at her and suggests that she's basically a closeted Republican who's just doing this for the press, as opposed to Kamala Harris, who's a closeted crazy person who's just doing this for the press. Here's Kamala Harris going after Tulsi Gabbard. I think that um, it, it's unfortunate that we have someone on the stage who is attempting to be the Democratic nominee for president of the United States, who during the Obama administration spent four years full time on Fox News criticizing President Obama, That's who ridiculous. has spent full time, That's who has spent full time criticizing people on this stage as affiliated with the Democratic Party. When Donald Trump was elected, not even sworn in buddied up to Steve Bannon to get a meeting with Donald Trump in the Trump Tower, fails to call a war criminal by what he is as a war criminal, and then spends full time during the course of this campaign, again, criticizing the Democratic Party. Okay, again, Kamala Harris is going to win no points with the audience for going after Tulsi Gabbard, and Tulsi is happy to take it because she ain't going anywhere in this race, right? And she's not going to be the Democratic nominee. Maybe she'll run as an independent or something. Being attacked by Kamala Harris is not the worst thing to happen to her. Okay, so then we get to the actual, the Democrats' radical proposals. Okay, and the, the radical proposals are just insane. This is particularly true when you get to their proposals on climate change, which bear no relation to reality at all in any way. This is also true of foreign policy. Right, so, so far, this has sort of been a personality battle. The, the MSNBC anchors wanted to make sure that the Democrats were never asked specific questions about their plans because the more specific the plans get, the worse Americans like them. And you can see this from the left-wing websites that cover the debates. The left-wing websites that cover the debates, they are firmly focused on, we can't have another one of these debates, guys, where we talk about Medicare for all. It's bad, it's bad. We just can't talk about it. <laughs> the last thing they want you to know is the actual plans of the Democratic Party. Unfortunately for the Democrats, some of that was able to seep out through the cracks, despite the best attempts of people like Rachel Maddow to prevent people from talking about what they would do as president of the United States. We'll get to more of Democratic policy in a moment. That's the stuff that really helps Trump in one second. But first, let's talk about the fact that it is open enrollment season. And during open enrollment season, that is the time for you to get life insurance. But the problem is this. When you get life insurance through your employer, it might represent what? Like one-tenth of the kind of life insurance you actually need as a responsible adult. This is why you should get life insurance that doesn't link to your job and also that is sufficient to cover you in case, God forbid, something happens to you. This is why you should check out PolicyGenius.com. PolicyGenius is the easy way to shop for a life insurance plan that is not tied to your job. In minutes, you can compare quotes from top insurers and find your best price. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape. The life insurance you buy through Policy Genius stays with you even if you leave your job. And Policy Genius can do all sorts of insurance for you. They can do home insurance and auto insurance and disability insurance. So when you are looking at your workplace benefits this month, make sure to double check those life insurance options. Then head on over to policygenius.com, get quotes, apply in minutes. Policy Genius is indeed the easy way to compare and buy life insurance and home insurance, auto insurance, disability insurance, all the insurance you could possibly want, need, or desire. Check them out at policygenius.com. Dot com. Okay, once you get to the actual Democratic proposals, this is where things get truly ugly. So here is Joe Biden talking about his plan for climate change and stumbling over himself. Again, Joe Biden didn't lose. Any, all the commentators today are saying Joe Biden had a rough night. Joe Biden has a rough night every night. It's called being Joe Biden and being alive. I mean, last night, Joe Biden learned that he had a grandchild in Arkansas he didn't even know about because Hunter Biden, his son, his, his ne'er-do-well son, who gets paid to sit on the board of Ukrainian oil and natural gas companies based on his vast experience in doing nothing and being kicked out of the Navy. Hunter Biden had contested paternity of a child in Arkansas, and it came out yesterday that, congratulations, Joe, you got a grandkid, right? So Joe Bi every night being Joe Biden is an adventure. Okay, so the fact that Joe Biden didn't perform great last night doesn't really hurt him. But what does hurt the Democrats is every time they talk about their climate change plans, they're totally insane. So here is Joe Biden talking about climate change. It is the existential threat to humanity. It's the number one issue. And I might add, I, I don't really need kind of a, a lecture from, this, from my friend. Uh, while uh, I was passing the first uh, climate change bill and that Flutifax said was a game changer, while I managed the uh, $90 billion uh, recovery plan, investing more money in infrastructure that related to clean energy than any time we've ever done it, 
my friend was uh, um, uh, producing more coal mines and produced more coal around the world, according to the press, than all of Great Britain produces. Uh, okay, so, I mean, him ripping on Tom Steyer ain't going to help him. But the fact that he's talking about like these these it's an existential threat to humanity, the number one issue, politifact, coal mines. Come on, come on. Okay, and that's not even as bad as as Bernie Sanders. Right? Bernie Sanders is the one who's just like, money is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in my pockets. It's in my pudding. There's money everywhere. And I will use all that money to do many things that I would like to do, having produced zero jobs or anything of value for my entire adult life. During my childhood, perhaps I produced something. When I was a small child, I made poop. But since then, I have done nothing useful. And now I will take all your money and I will throw it at the sun. I hate the sun. It's very mean. Here's Bernie Sanders. What we have got to do tonight, and I will do as president, is to tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. And by the way, the fossil fuel industry is probably criminally liable because they have lied and lied and lied ah! when they had the evidence that their carbon ah! products were destroying the planet. And maybe we should think about prosecuting them as well. Why is the moon made of cheese? Why? Why is the moon made of cheese? Why is my head so shiny? I don't know what's going on. I don't know. We should prosecute people who run the oil industry, which is powering the lights in this room. We should prosecute the people in the oil industry for having used carbon-based fuel that has powered the growth of the globe for the past 150 years. I like pudding. Do you understand? Like, the more Americans see of that, do you really think that's going to resonate? Okay, then we get to foreign policy. And again, the policy prescriptions of the Democrats is is totally crazy. It's totally crazy. Okay, the the and and what you get here is a combination of Joe Biden, who's been wrong on every foreign policy issue of his lifetime, stumbling over himself, and then you get and, and then you get Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders suggesting a Middle Eastern foreign policy that makes no sense at all. So let, let's let's go first of all before we get to that aspect of foreign policy. I just want to point out what an irritating person Elizabeth Warren is for like the thirtieth time. Okay, the reason that I say that Elizabeth Warren is a deeply irritating human being is because, listen to this exchange. Okay, so this is clip 18. So Andrew Yang is asked by one of the moderators what he would say to Vladimir Putin if he wins the 2020 election. And Yang gets off a pretty good laugh line. And then listen to Warren come in from the wings with a bat, like a character from Goodfellas, and beat the joke to death and bury it in a shallow grave in a cornfield in Iowa. I mean, it's really amazing. Here, here, is, here is Andrew Yang giving a funny answer and Elizabeth Warren clubbing this joke to death like a baby seal. Mr. Yang, if you win the 2020 election, what would you say in your first call with Russian President Vladimir Putin? (laughs) Well, first I'd say I'm sorry I beat your guy. (laughs) Or not sorry. Not sorry. (laughs) It's a sorry, not sorry. Oh, my God. Elizabeth Warren, you're just the worst. You're the worst. People who murder jokes are the worst kind of murderers. They're like the O.J. Simpsons of our world. It's just, it's just terrible. Terrible. Uh, okay, then you get to the actual foreign policy statements of Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders on the Middle East. And these make no sense. If you take more than half a second to think about it, it makes no sense at all. None. Okay, we'll get to all of that in just one moment. First, you need to go subscribe over at Daily Wire. Why should you subscribe? Well, the reason you should subscribe is because we have all sorts of goodies for you. So for example, our Sunday special with David Berlinski comes out this Sunday. But if you're a subscriber, then you get it on Saturday. Here's a little bit of what that Sunday special sounds like. All these guys who proclaim themselves enthusiastic defenders of reason, the enlightenment, are simply a part of a very long Judeo-Christian tradition. And they are unwilling to see in their own faces the long tendrils stretching back into antiquity. It's a really, really interesting interview. David Berlinski is a philosopher, mathematician, really interesting dude. Well, if you're not already a subscriber, you are really missing out. Head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. For as little as 10 bucks a month, you get our articles ad-free, access to all of our live broadcasts, our full show library, select bonus content, our exclusive Daily Wire app, pretty great feature if you haven't checked it out yet. 
And if you choose the new all-access plan, you get all of that, plus the legendary Leftist Tears Tumblr, our brand new Ask Me Anything style discussion feature that allows you to engage with our hosts and our writers and our special guests on a weekly basis. So stop depriving yourself. This is America. Come join the fun over at dailywire.com slash subscribe. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Okay, so Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders lay out the Democratic foreign policy. And suffice it to say, it is completely ignorant of the situation in the Middle East. So Joe Biden is asked about his policy on Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is a disaster area. And Saudi Arabia is a repressive Islamic dictatorship. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible place. But it is also true that Saudi Arabia is the regional check on Iran, which is an even more horrible place in the sense that Iran has regional aspirations that Saudi Arabia does not. Sometimes there are no good guys. But according to the Democratic Party, the solution in the Middle East is to defund the government of Saudi Arabia so that presumably the Iranians will be able to maximize their regional power and so that the Saudi government is in danger of falling to Islamic radicals who are more radical than the Saudi government, which is in fact the danger in Saudi Arabia, which would be a danger to not only global oil supply, but also a danger to the region because if you have even more militant people in charge of Saudi Arabia, how do you think that's going to go with Iran? Here's Joe Biden, though, suggesting that because Saudi Arabia is, is horrible and terrible, therefore we should think about ending our relationship with Saudi Arabia, which would benefit Iran. There's very little social redeeming value of the, in the present uh, government in Saudi Arabia. And I would also, as pointed out, I would end, end the subsidies that we have, end the sale of material to the Saudis where they're going in and murdering children and they're murdering innocent people. And so they have to be held accountable. Okay, so you know, again, I'm fine with holding the Saudis accountable, but what he's talking about is defunding the Saudis. Bernie Sanders goes even further. So Bernie Sanders is a complete loon bag. Not only that, he's an anti-Israel radical loon bag. So here is Bernie Sanders comparing the state of Israel to Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, fully crazy. And then suggesting that the United States should make alliance with Hamas, Palestinian Authority, and Islamic Jihad. And then claiming he's pro-Israel. Because Bernie Sanders is a crazy person, a crazy human being. This is why, again, Pete Buttigieg standing off to the side and being not crazy is definitely helping him here. All he has to, I've been saying since the day Donald Trump was elected, all Democrats had to be was not crazy. That means the Democrat who appears to be the least crazy is the person with the advantage. Bernie Sanders ain't helping the case. Here's Bernie Sanders clip 20. We have got to bring Iran and Saudi Arabia together in a room under American leadership and say we are sick and tired of us spending huge amounts of money and human resources because of your conflicts. And by the way, the same thing goes with Israel and the Palestinians. It is no longer good enough for us simply to be pro-Israel. I am pro-Israel, but we must treat the Palestinian people <laughs> as well with the respect and dignity that they deserve. What is going on in Gaza right now, where youth unemployment is 70 or 80 percent, is unsustainable. So we need to be rethinking who our allies are around the world, work with the United Nations, and not continue to support brutal dictatorships. Okay, he just compared Israel to the brutal dictatorships of Iran and Saudi Arabia, suggested that the unemployment rate in the Gaza Strip is not due to the fact that a terrorist group runs the Gaza Strip called Hamas. He blamed it on Israel, and then he said he was pro-Israel. That's nuts. That's nuts. And that's why when Pete Buttigieg says stuff that's not completely crazy, he sounds like a viable alternative. So here's Pete Buttigieg talking about reprioritizing the military budget. So he's asked, are you going to cut the military budget? Watch Pete Buttigieg avoid saying he's going to cut the military budget. Now, realistically, will he slash the military budget? Of course, he's a radical Democrat. But does he say that? No, because he's actually smart enough to hide his agenda. Here's Pete Buttigieg on military spending. We need to reprioritize our budget as a whole and our military spending in particular. It's not just how much, although we certainly need to look at the runaway growth in military spending. It's also where. Right now, we are spending a fraction of the intention and resources on things like the artificial intelligence research that China is doing right now. If we fall behind on artificial intelligence, the most expensive ships that the United States is building just turn into into bigger targets. Okay, so all of that is perfectly reasonable, what he is saying right there, right? He, he sounds like the reasonable guy on the stage. And then when you get to the abortion issue, he wasn't asked a question about abortion, but Elizabeth Warren and Cory Booker were, and they sounded nuts, right? So Elizabeth Warren is asked about abortion, and she gives the most bizarre answer on abortion that I can remember in recent memory. This is clip 28. Warren talking about abortion rights. She says, abortion rights are human rights, which is weird because it's the killing of a human, but apparently it's a human right to kill another human. Here's Elizabeth Warren saying something wild on abortion. 
And if they think this is going to win over middle of the country voters, good luck with this. Here is Elizabeth Warren. I believe that abortion rights are human rights. I believe that they are also economic rights. And protecting the right of a woman to be able to make decisions about her own body is fundamentally what we do and what we stand for as a Democratic Party. Understand this. When someone makes abortion illegal in America, rich women will still get abortions. It's just going to fall hard on poor women. Okay, that's just nonsense. I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The number of abortions in the United States per year before Roe versus Wade was like one one hundredth of the number of abortions that happened after Roe versus Wade. And if her contention is that poor women should have more abortions because they need to kill babies in order to rise on the economic ladder, that's more of a moral problem than anything your opponents are saying. Then Cory Booker says something even crazier. Cory Booker somehow links abortion to voter suppression. He suggests that the reason that people are pro-life in Georgia is because they're suppressing votes and that Stacey Abrams is actually the governor of Georgia. This is nuts. Okay, this is crazy towns. Here's Cory Booker joining the crazy parade. This is a voter suppression issue. Right here in this great state of Georgia, it was the voter suppression, particularly of African-American communities, that prevented us from having a Governor Stacey Abrams right now. Yes. And this bill, opposed by over 70 percent, the heartbeat bill here, opposed by over 70 percent of Georgians, is the result from voter suppression. Really? It's the result of voter suppression. So it's not that the state legislature passed a bill signed into law by the governor, all of whom were duly elected. No, it was it was voter suppression. Voter suppre- by the way, you want to talk about the ultimate voter suppression? How about the killing of potential voters before they have a chance to be born? That seems like a pretty effective form of voter suppression. Okay, but in the end, in the end, what is this Democratic Party debate really about for all of these candidates? In the end, it's about your intersectional credentials. And and, and listening to why Democrats believe they are qualified to be president is highly, highly amusing. Highly amusing because their actual qualifications are non-existent. None of them on the stage have actually done anything other than maybe Biden. Right. Other than Biden, who actually has been a longtime senator who worked across the aisle on some important issues, like, for example, criminal justice reform. Other than Biden, no one on the stage has done a damn thing. Elizabeth Warren has never done a thing. Right? She proposed the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. And that is one of the most unconstitutional pieces of government in American history. Bernie Sanders has been a career long useless person. Cory Booker was mayor of Newark and then left before, uh, like, as his city continued to be in a state of collapse. The, the, Pete Buttigieg has run a city of 100,000 people. He won election with 11,000 votes. Pete Buttigieg won election in South Bend with fewer votes than Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez won her district in New York. Okay, he is not, a, th- there is no electoral qualification for Pete Buttigieg. So what actually makes these people qualified? And so this is really funny. So let's talk about Buttigieg. Right, so Buttigieg is asked how he is going to win over black voters and basically says, I'm going to win over black voters because I'm gay. And that's his actual answer. His actual answer is, I'm going to win over black voters because I'm gay. And just like black people have been victimized in this country, I have been victimized in this country. Now, Pete Buttigieg cannot name an example of when he was actually victimized in this country. The only reason that he is being taken seriously on the stage is because he is gay. If he were not gay, then Pete Buttigieg would just be another well-spoken, small-town white mayor from red state America. Right? There are other people, I mean... Th- Remember Martin O'Malley? Remember Martin O'Malley in 2016? He was mayor of Baltimore. White guy, fairly well-spoken. Went nowhere. Pete Buttigieg is getting all sorts of press, specifically because there's something unique about his candidacy in that he is gay. And he's playing on that right here. But if you're going to say that Pete Buttigieg is victimized in the same way that black Americans historically have been victimized in America, that's absolute sheer, it's just crap. It's not true. Mike Pence was governor of Indiana when Pete Buttigieg came out of the closet, which by the way, was only like five or six years ago. Right, he came out of the closet, got married to his partner, Chase, like three or four years ago, if, I, if I'm not missing the timeline. He only came out of the closet publicly once he was already mayor of South Bend, Indiana, at which point Mike Pence was like, you know, go and be well, basically. Like at no point in Pete Buttigieg's life has he faced actual serious hardship for being a gay man in America. If he can name it, I'm willing to hear it, but he certainly is not... His history is not the history of black people in America. Here's Pete Buttigieg, though, trying to make the case that he should be president of the United States because he has intersectional valor. Here's clip 24. And I care about this because while I do not have the experience of ever having been discriminated against because of the color of my skin, I do have the experience of sometimes feeling like a stranger in my own country. 
turning on the news and seeing my own rights come up for debate, and seeing my rights expanded by a coalition of people like me and people not at all like me, working side by side, shoulder to shoulder, making it possible for me to be standing here wearing this wedding ring in a way that couldn't have happened two elections ago, lets me know just how deep my obligation is to help those whose rights are on the line every day, even if they are nothing like me in their experience. Okay, that, that is a beautifully put pitch. It also happens not to be true that Pete Buttigieg has experienced serious discrimination because he is a gay man in America. Like, there's not evidence of this. I'm waiting to hear the evidence of this, other than just the generalized argument that that until 2015 Obergefell decision, he was not, he, he could not get a tax break from the government for being married. Civil unions were still available in Indiana, so far as I'm aware, and no one was prosecuting him for living with another man. So that, none of that was on the table. In any case, Buttigieg's other pitch, so one is that he has special intersectional valor because he is gay. His other pitch is that he is not wealthy. Not kidding. This is his actual other pitch. His other pitch in the Democratic Party, it's actually a point in your favor if you are not wealthy. So in a normal world, you having earned money by running a business would be seen as a good thing. In the world of the Democratic Party, it is much better to run if you are not rich, right? If you are if you are a person of middle class or poor circumstances, somehow this is a point in your favor. You should run the entire economy of the United States from the top down as a Democrat because you are an elitist who wants to run everybody else's life. And your experience in doing this is having no money. Here's Pete Buttigieg's clip 31.5, basically, is Pete Buttigieg suggesting that he is the least wealthy person on stage and somehow this qualifies him as more honest or something. I never thought I'd be on a Forbes magazine list, but uh, they did one of all the candidates by wealth, and I am literally the least wealthy person on this stage. <laughs> I also wore the uniform of this country and know what is at stake in the decisions that are made in the Oval Office in the Situation Room. And I know how to bring people together to get things done. I know that from the perspective of Washington, what goes on in my city might look small, but frankly, where we live, the infighting on Capitol Hill is what looks small. Okay, so basically, I'm not from Washington, D.C. I served in the military. Millions of people served in the military. Thank them for their service. Thank you, Pete Buttigieg, for your service. That ain't a sole qualifier. And also, you're not wealthy. I love the fact that I'm not wealthy is an actual pitch for the presidency as opposed to a pitch for why you should not be in charge of the government. (laughs) In a normal world, people who earn lots of money in a free market economy, that would be a point in their favor. But in the Democratic Party, it's shameful that Tom Steyer is on the stage because he's a billionaire. But it's very, very valorous that Pete Buttigieg is on the stage having one election by winning like 11,000 votes in a small town in the middle of America. It's pretty impressive. So that's Pete Buttigieg's pitch. Okay, then there is Amy Klobuchar's pitch. So her pitch, we don't have the clip of this, but she actually suggested that she should be president because she's a woman. Yeah, that she's discriminated against because she's a woman. Sure, I'm sure it's that. I'm sure it's not that Buttigieg has stolen your thunder. I'm sure it's not that your initial campaign launch was surrounded by stories of you throwing binders at your aides. I'm sure, I'm sure it's not that. And then Cory Booker was like, yeah, well, I'm a Rhodes Scholar. It's like, oh my God, what are you guys, applying to college? Like, these are all qualifications to apply to an Ivy League school. None of these things are actual qualifications to be president of the United States. It's pretty astonishing. Okay, Kamala Harris basically came out and said, the reason I'm qualified for president is because I too am intersectional because I am a black woman. This is clip 23. So again, the, the real pitch to the Democratic base isn't my ideas are better or I'm going to be unifying or I have great experience in this job bringing people together. Right. Most of their pitches were like, I'm a woman, I'm gay, I'm not wealthy, I'm a Rhodes Scholar. Pretty weak tea. Here's Kamala Harris saying that the reason that she's running is to bring back together the Obama coalition and apparently only an identity politics black woman can do so. Clip 23. And I'm running for president because I believe that we have to have leadership in this country who has worked with and have the experience of working with all folks. And we've got to recreate the Obama coalition to win. And that means about women, that's people of color, that's our LGBTQ community, that's working people, that's our labor unions. But that is how we are going to win this election. And I intend to win. Okay, yeah, no, you're not. You're, You're going nowhere. You're going nowhere. My favorite was the closer from Joe Biden on this. So Joe Biden was asked specifically about that coalition and what are his qualifications. Now, his qualifications in all of this is, I'm a senator who worked every day for people across the country. Right? I'm a vice president who worked every day with people across the country. Instead, Joe Biden takes one step and immediately falls directly on his face and breaks his nose. Here is Joe Biden, clip 27, explaining that he is part of the Obama coalition. 
I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of that, that Obama coalition. I come out of the black community in terms of my support. If you notice, I have more people supporting me in the black community that have announced for me because they know me. They know who I am. Three former chairs of the Black Caucus, the only African-American woman that ever been elected to the United States Senate. A whole range of people. No, my point no, is not true. The other that's one is true. here. Okay, so there he is stumbling. <laughs> the only black woman who had ever been elected to the to the United States Senate. Well, yeah, I mean, Kamala Harris is standing right there. So well done, Joe. Okay, so in the end, here's what you have. Buttigieg didn't get even mildly grazed last night. I mean, nobody launched a serious attack on him. The only serious attack was at one point, Amy Klobuchar pointed out that he has no experience and he's a small town mayor. That was it. No attacks on his plans, no attack on his record, nothing. So Buttigieg walks out unscathed. Warren continues to sort of flounder because she's got nothing. Joe Biden is an ambulant. He's a dead person walking. He is, he is weekend at, at Joe's. They, they've propped him up on a, on a gurney and they're just walking him around at this point. But everybody knows that. And Bernie Sanders continues to be crazy. So do the polls radically shift after all of this? No, they don't. Which means actually good news for Joe Biden and good news for Pete Buttigieg. So those are the big winners of the night, even though Joe Biden, again, was stumbling and bumbling. But all of that is baked into the cake. OK, time for a quick thing I like and a quick thing that I hate. And then we will be out of here. So things that I like today. There's a great book by C. Bradley Thompson called America's Revolutionary Mind. It came out just a couple of weeks ago. And the book is an exploration of the American Revolution and the philosophy of the American Revolution, what exactly the founders were thinking on everything from slavery to natural rights. And it's, it's a really great compendium of the, of the thought of the founding fathers. Again, the book is called America's Revolutionary Mind, and the author is C. Bradley Thompson. It is well worth the read. It is a fantastic source book on sort of the history of the American Revolution, at least the, the history of thought surrounding the American Revolution. And it definitely gives the lie to the idea that the founding fathers were just a bunch of rich white property holders who were only interested in preserving their own spot at the top of the hierarchy. I mean, if it, but anybody who has read any of the founding fathers knows that that is not true, that that is just revisionist history. This book makes that obvious. See Bradley Thompson's America's Revolutionary Mind. Okay, time for some quick things that I hate. Okay, so first of all, Cats. So Cats is a, is a movie musical that is coming out it's a horrible musical, Cats. I mean, just an, tr a truly awful piece of garbage. There are certain Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals that are well-crafted, right, that are good. Phantom of the Opera is good. Joseph and the, and the Technicolor Dreamcoat is, if not a great musical, it has some great stuff in it. Uh, Cats is just horrible. And there was always this big question on Broadway because it ran forever. Why exactly did Cats do so well? And the answer is there are a lot of blue hairs who have cats and like cats and they want to hear cats sing. So... The only problem with this is when you transfer this to film, it is the creepiest crap anybody has ever seen. Here is a, they've released a second trailer now. Now, the first trailer creeped everybody out because it was anthropomorphized, anthropomorphized cats who were human beings singing to you, and it was scary and creepy like a childhood nightmare come to life. The new one ain't going to save you any sleep. Here is here's the new Cats trailer. Oh, it's no. Quiet. This deserving cat will be reborn into another life. So they can be who they've always dreamed of being. What's your name? Cat got your tongue? Here we go! <laughs> okay, that is the most horrifying. That is that is just awful. Idris Elba, what are you doing, man? No, don't do it. Don't do it. And this cast is enormous. And Taylor Swift, for some reason. Crazy cat lady. Uh, oh no! It's oh god. Now it is time to make <laughs> who, the choice. Who, who, who thought this was a good idea? Work, who, who? That's what I say to you. I mean, th this movie is going to. If this movie makes money, the country's done. Okay, I'm just gonna put it out there. If this movie does well at the box office, we deserve whatever we get, including a nuclear apocalypse. This is just horrifying. Tom Hooper is a good director. Right, he's the guy who did the King's Speech, and he did Les Mis also. Les Mis is a pretty good film adaptation. Why you would adapt Cats to screen and have Taylor Swift wearing a bodysuit? So you've got like weird, sexy, anthropomorphized cats. Like, what is what is going on? Stop it! The nightmares. Oh, the nightmares. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, one other thing that I hate. So there's a story out today from the Census Bureau talking about how fewer Americans are moving uh, than ever before. According to the New York Times, Americans are moving at the lowest rate since the government started keeping track, according to the Census Bureau data released on Wednesday. The U.S. has long been one of the most mobile countries in the developed world. 
In the 1950s, about one-fifth of the American population moved each year. These days, rents have exploded, making it much harder for a young person seeking better opportunities to afford to move. That doesn't even make any sense. If rents have exploded, it should make it more likely that you move. People typically moved when they needed to move. Now, people just stick around and wait for the government to take care of them or suggest that their dying town is going to suddenly be revived as long as we tax the rich people with a wealth tax or something. It is a bad thing that Americans are moving less than ever. Now, listen, I live very close to where I grew up, but I left here for law school when my wife thought that she was going to have to go to medical school in Washington, D.C. We prepped the move. When I thought I was going to have to get a job in New York City, we prepped the move. It was not unwillingness to move. It was that we didn't have to move. But if we'd had to move, we would move. If we have to move our entire company, we'll move our entire company. The fact is that willingness to move is a good sign that you are willing to make your life better. And the fact that more Americans are not moving in a time of great prosperity and easy mobility, it used to take a long time to move. Now you can do it in like two days across the country. That is not That, that shows that there is, there is something amiss in, in the way Americans are thinking about what their lives ought to be. As I've said before, the only thing you're guaranteed in America is the adventure. If you're not going to take adv- advantage of the adventure, then you're missing not only half the joy of life, but you are also missing a lot of opportunities. So, you know, get on your running shoes and be willing to move if the opportunity crops up somewhere that you don't live. All right, we'll be back here later today for two additional hours, including all your impeachment gate updates. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Robert Sterling, directed by Mike Joyner, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, and our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Assistant director Pavel Wydowski, edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. On The Matt Walsh Show, we're not just discussing politics. We're talking culture, faith, family, all of the things that are really important to you. So come join the conversation. 